Yeah, good afternoon. I'm going to try and keep you awake. It's always uh, fun to be the last person at the end of a busy day. And, uh, and so if I see any of you sleeping, I'll have to crack uh, football jokes or something. Um, I'd just like to introduce you to, to Don Stacy, who I know you have met earlier. And the reason I've asked Don to join me on the podium today is that I had to miss uh, part of today. Uh, and so I didn't hear all of the presentations. And so I may cover things that you've already covered. And if so, you just let me know. Um, as, as uh, Michael alluded to, in Saskatchewan, uh, we, we decided to do something a little bit different. Our patients, uh, are not unlike patients in the rest of, of the world, um, were quite unhappy with some of the things that were happening in healthcare. And uh, at the change of the government, there was a decision made that we would actually start to ask our patients questions about what they did and didn't like about the healthcare system. And our patients gave us over, uh, over you know, three or four hundred recommendations. Of those recommendations, four or five of them were really significant. And certainly one of them was a cry, a battle cry that comes out of, um, well, I, I remember it from the disability movement, although it's probably come out of many other places as well, and that is the cry of nothing about us without us. And uh, the government really took that very seriously and started an initiative called the Patient First Initiative. So whenever you think about Saskatchewan, um, you'll, you'll hear that comment about patient first and I'm going to talk to you about that as it relates to the work I do in clinical pathways. So the first thing I do, and I love to do this, and I'm sure many of you know exactly where Saskatchewan is, but I say, where is Saskatchewan and how is this relevant? <laughs> so um, first of all, I've shown you North America, and Saskatchewan, of course, is, is, is the shape in Canada, which is right in the middle, the, the heart of Canada. Um, it's an interesting piece of land. There's uh, over 650,000 square kilometers, a kilometer being just a little smaller than a mile, uh, square kilometers of land. And if you look at the, the blown up map on the side, you'll see that all the people, and there's only a million of them, but all the people that do exist in this province hug the southern edge of the province. In the north, there's virtually nobody. And if you look carefully, you'll also see that there's really no roads. So those communities are what we call fly-in communities, or in fact, winter road communities. So if you, if you watch uh, shows like the winter trucking shows, well, those take place up in this part of the world. Gorgeous, gorgeous country. What does that matter to the presentation I'm going to give you today? Well, the presentation, the reason it matters is because I'm going to share with you the information that we collected in one of our northernmost communities called Prince Albert. And it, it was an, it's a community that actually services the far north. So in the far north, we have many different dialects. They're indigenous people. There's many different dialects, and, um, and including two different dialects of uh, Cree and also Diné. So um, a, a little bit of a challenge in terms of servicing that, that group of people. We began, like so many other people in Canada, and I don't know if in the States this is a big issue, but uh, in 2004 our first ministers got together and decided that they would tackle wait times, and I'm not sure exactly what the politics were behind it, but they decided that, that hip and knee would be the area that they would tackle. Uh, what you see here on the map in front of you, in the circle around it, is actually our wait times for hip and knee surgeries, and they begin on the far left in April in, of 2004, and at the, at the uh, uh, line that comes down in, in 2009, and that's because it's the point at which we're going to begin our discussion. What you see is that, in fact, our, our wait list is very stable. The black wait list, the black circle is actually our overall wait list. The other ones represent 18 months, 12 months, 6 months, and 3 months. So you see that, um, that the wait list was actually fairly stable, and it was a huge challenge with, uh, with a lot of people waiting for joint replacement surgery and the wait list just not going down. What I won't show you in, in addition to that is that, again, not, like, not unlike ha what happens in much of the world, in Saskatchewan we have a bimodal population curve, which simply means that uh, when our... our uh, Mothers and fathers went off to war and came back and, and had, were lonely. <laughs> and they produced an awful lot of us at one time. And uh, we have this bump of us that are moving through and into the 65 age plus. 
group. We know in uh, Saskatchewan that over 35% of the services used by people in our healthcare system are used by that demographic and we know that over the next 10 years that demographic is going to continue to increase. In fact, we know that in 10 years if we don't change something, we actually won't be able to have a healthcare system as we know it today because currently we're using 36% of our gross domestic product on healthcare and that number is growing by about 6% a year and if we continue to grow at that rate in 10 years there won't be any schools, there won't be any libraries and there won't be any care. And so we embarked on what we call a big hairy audacious problem and that is we're going to transform the healthcare system putting the patient first, giving higher quality care than we've given in the future, uh, in the past, ensuring that patients were happy with their care and actually, and actually just doing this whole thing better. And people said it couldn't be done. So um, I'm only going to talk one little piece of it, but I will let you know that we are doing it across the board. In, um, in Pathways, as we said earlier, hip and knee was, was one of the problems. And so um, I had the privilege of leading a, a really great team, a team of uh, surgeons, orthopedic surgeons, uh, uh, a multidisciplinary team with physios and administration, nurses, patients. And we, we began to look at what the challenge was. And we said, there's a couple of things that are challenges here. There's, there's a wait list to actually come in and see the orthopedic surgeon in Saskatchewan. That wait list was about 18 months. And then there's a wait list to actually have joint replacement surgery and that wait list was up to four years. So people were waiting a very long time. We started to look at, at um, what we call surgical yield and that is really just looking at how many people see a surgeon compared to how many people actually need to have surgical intervention. And that number was about 36%. So most of our people, actually a, a quite a big majority of people, really didn't need to have surgical intervention. Some of them, of course, would be appropriate to see a surgeon anyway, but large numbers of them were better supported and helped by other members of the team. And so we began a, a solution that looked like this. We had the little patient coming in to see their primary care provider. The primary care provider performed a standard assessment and triage, and then they were sent to a multidisciplinary clinic. In the clinic, they were, they were further triaged, they were provided education. Um, if there was a surgery required, they provided a surgical consult and prep. And if there was not surgical, they sent them back into the community with a plan for how they would be rehabbed and they continued to follow them up. What was the impact? Well, the impact was dramatic. The impact, as we showed on, on, the, uh, on the list before, was a real reduction in the amount of time that people waited for assessment. We went down to three weeks. And because there was a, a lower number of people actually hitting the orthopedic surgeon's offices, they were spending more time in surgery, less time doing assessment, and our other wait lists dropped as well. We also did a lot of back-end work looking at standardizing instrument sets and so on. There's a lot of things I could talk to you about that, but that's not really the topic of today. But we did have some pretty major successes. And these are the goals of the pathway. I'll just show you this really fast. And so it's, it's maximizing the use of other professionals and standardizing care, which of course is, is what is uh, always done in pathways. And I, I want to just point, your, your, to point out to the last item on that list, which is increasing patient satisfaction with quality of care. And the reason I point that out is because I'm going to talk a lot about quality of care. In fact, when I did my master's thesis, I did it on um, health-related quality of life. And so it's just an area of tremendous interest to me. So just quickly, just showing you through the pictures of, of the preparation of the work that we were doing in the clinics with the patients, actually preparing them, showing them techniques, showing them what to expect expect when they got home um, to be prepared for that and also a post-surgical rehab program. Impacts on the patients. This is coming from uh, EQ5D, European Quality of Life in Five Dimensions. And again, um, it's showing you the change. So this isn't the, the degree of satisfaction, but the change in improvement. So this is patient self-reported at six months. We had a 30.6% improvement in activity, 16.3 reduction in anxiety, an increase in mobility, a de decrease in pain, and an increase in, in self-care. So pretty dramatic. We were, we were pleased with that. 
Here's something that I'm going to point out to you, and then again, I'm going to come back to this slide a little, little later on. Um, this is a scattergram, and what we've done here is we've actually tried to analyze what happened with the patient. So in an EQ5D, if you score one, um, you're perfect. If you score zero, you're worse than death. And so uh, the line, the, the, the diagonal line and everything above it are people who actually improved as a result of the intervention. The line below it are people who got worse. And um, you see two different grams, they're, they're a year apart. Um, you'll see that the, the improvement there is not significant. It's from 14.06 to 13.79, so it's not statistically significant. The change, and so that's a pretty standard, um, that's a pretty static diagram. What, we, that, what that means is that a good 15% of the people that we're working with, that we perform a joint replacement surgery on, are actually telling us at six months they're less satisfied than they were before surgery. I think that's serious. And I bet you if anybody else checked it out, your numbers wouldn't be dissimilar to that. So what's our solution? Well, after the patient first began, um, we started looking at what could we do differently, and that's when we formed a relationship with Annette O'Connor and Don Stacy, and we began looking at the impact of shared decision making, the impact of not simply informing patients, but really engaging patients and asking them to be part of the solution. We formed a Bill of Rights, which is both your rights and your responsibilities. So, um, you know, I, I heard a lot of people this morning talking about um, patient rights. I, I agree with that, but it's just like raising a child. I didn't give them my new car uh, before they also demonstrated that they were capable of washing it and vacuuming it and cleaning it up and not speeding. So uh, we do the same thing. We have rights and responsibilities. And I'm going to talk to you about this area in Prince Albert that we just talked about. We have patients coming in long distances, some of them are taking up to two days because of the transportation needs to get into this community. We want to make sure when we see them that we're handling this appropriately. So um, a lot of the things we heard was, you know, you bring me down here, I have my surgical consult, you send me back home, you bring me back and you prep me for surgery, and you send me back home and you bring me back for surgery. And it's no wonder that we had some very un unhappy patients. So what we did here, same picture you saw earlier, only you see that we've added a couple of things. One is that we, we actually took all of our educational material and we translated it into all of the dialects that were common to those, to those people. So two dialects of Cree and one dialect of Diné. We also uh, made sure that the people in those videos were, were culturally appropriate. If you're living in a, in a far northern community and someone says, well, what I really want you to do is hit the gym and get yourself a personal trainer and I want you to do so and so many reps of this or that, and the people are looking out at a frozen wasteland and they're saying, yeah, and the personal trainer, and which pool was that the ocean you wanted me to chop a hole in, or what were you thinking I was going to do? So what we have to do is we have to have culturally appropriate material, culturally appropriate exercises, people from their community speaking to the people. Another very interesting thing that happened here as we began working with them when we were doing our shared decision making in, in this environment, and we were talking to people about surgery, and there were just these horrified expressions on people's faces. And finally, we, we, you know, and they're, they're, they tend to be very quiet people, so they don't often don't share what they're thinking. So we finally got to the bottom of what was happening. And within their culture, if you talk about surgery, when you talk about cutting something off, you're actually removing their soul. So what they thought when we would set, talk about surgery is we were actually cutting out their soul and we were slowly killing them in, in, in a spiritual way. So very, very important that we began to have culturally sensitive material that didn't talk about that. We talked about we're going to do something which is going to make you better. We're going to give you something new, a new knee. We're not taking out the old one. We're giving you a new one and it's going to make you better. So it was, it, it's really learning uh, the needs of your people and how you speak to them. So this was our solution. What happened? Well, we decided to run a pilot study, and this is where Dawn is going to help me if I, if I fumble or, or, or mix, mess up at all. She's going to come in and say, actually, this is the way we did it. Um, but um, we had two groups, and they were sequential. What's really interesting about this, this study, while it's a very small center, it was 100% of all people. So all people flow through the MDCs, the multidisciplinary clinics. Nobody goes to the orthopedic surgeons. So we ran it sequentially. First of all, we ran it just the way that you saw in the first set of slides. And then in the second group, we, we added the shared decision making and the culturally sensitive material. 
So um, let's look at what happened. There's our flow. You can see what, what happened is that in most cases there was a couple of people for whatever reason didn't make it through the, the whole study, but we eliminated them. We did our shared decision making. We did our knowledge. We did our confidence, our sure scale. How confident are you? We asked them their values. Um, we looked at things, other things. Our, our orthopedic surgeons were absolutely convinced that body mass index was a, a reason for stopping doing joint replacements. So we, we measured that. And I won't show you that here, but if any of you are interested, we've now tracked it for three years and there's no difference. So, um, But very interestingly, we, we, we tracked that information. We tracked the EQ5D, the European Quality of Life in five dimensions. We tracked the VAS, which is a, a, just a score of, you know, if I stopped you right now today on a scale of 1 to 100, where would you place yourself in terms of satisfaction? Is there anything else you wanted to say about that? No. That, so we, we, we filled that form out and we fill it out manually, which is, uh, you know, a lot of work, but we're, we're going to work with Dawn and she's going to help us to get that all uh, right, Dawn? I'm making a commitment here publicly. Yeah, so she's going to do it. She's going to help us to get that electronic. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you put, put me up on I did, the I did. I actually just put you up here actually just to embarrass you. How's it going so far? Yeah, 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 yeah it's okay. So um, here's, our, here's some information on the knowledge, the comparison of knowledge and first visit to, uh, to the people the people who were, uh, went through the MDC and the people who actually had the shared decision making. Once again, I don't think there should be any, any surprise to you, but you'll see that there, it's a percent of knowledge. So on the far left, you'll see that 0% of knowledge on the far right is 100% of knowledge. The people with shared decision making are in the red and the other people are in the blue. And so it's, it's going to be no surprise to you, the people who got the materials in advance and had an opportunity to check their knowledge are, are really on the far side of that knowledge. They understand a lot more about what's happening to them and what their choices are. And there it's just uh, it's just sort of a, a roll up on it. So you'll see that I started to ask some questions here and I'm going to ask you to kind of keep some of those questions in mind because these are the questions that were going through my head, the curious questions. Um, so uh, what is the impact of making a decision without having the knowledge to make that decision? If you don't have decisional conflict, but you don't have complete knowledge to make your decision, what is the impact on how you feel about your decision? That goes back to the whole question. I had a, a man come up to me when we started this study. He was about 45 years old, and he had had a bilateral joint replacement. And he probably needed it. I, I, I couldn't tell you if he needed it or not, but he probably did. But, uh, you know, his surgeon certainly felt he did, and he had it done, and it was, I think, quite successful. He seems to be walking quite well. He seems to have minimal pain. He's furious. And I said, why are you furious? Well, he says, I'm furious because maybe I didn't need this. And you know, my, my golf game has really suffered since I've had this joint replacement. And he said, I didn't know my golf game was going to suffer. And if somebody had told me my golf game was going to suffer, maybe I would have handled the pain a little longer. So, you know, whether that's valid or not, I don't know, but, but it's valid to him. So it, it, it's, it's the whole point. Yep. So one of the things I'd just like to point out on this slide is that when I started working with the ministry in Saskatchewan is Gwyn said we really need a measure of how confident does the patient feel about the decision. And so that's what's showing up on this slide is we ask the patients a, a ten on a, between 0 and 10 how confident do you feel about the decision after we'd asked the SURE test and after we'd asked their knowledge questions and their values. We also wanted to know their confidence. Yeah, so, and this is because we're trying to get at, a, at, a, at some of these, these uh, measurement issues. So I want to show you this slide. This is actually our EQ5D slide. I'm going to explain it to you so you don't have to spend a lot of time looking at it. There's a pentagon in the middle. And, and if you're in that pentagon, you're perfect. That's when you've estimated that you're perfect. Again, this is at six months. You'll see that when I showed you the scattergram earlier, I showed it to you at six months. This is also at six months. What's really interesting is I've done a comparison here. On the left is Saskatoon Health Region, our biggest health region in the province. On the right is Prince Albert Health Region following the changes that we made to the program. Now, I don't know if any of you notice what I do, but in the blue is our pre, uh, you know, b before they've ever had any interventions. The yellow is at six weeks, the purple is at, at, uh, at six months, and the red is at a year. And if you look at Prince Albert, look at what's happening in the red. They're perfect. They're 100%. Uh, if, if I do an objective piece of research on them, they aren't any better than anyone else's. They're exactly the same. But do you see at, at a year, these people are telling me, as far as I'm concerned, my care is perfect. I have perfect mobility. I have, I have no pain. I'm satisfied with my self-care. I have no anxiety and so on. Huh. 
That's an interesting one, isn't it? Really quite dramatically different than what we see in the other regions. I don't know all the answers to it, but I sure know we want to do some investigation. So does confidence level change before and after the visit at the MDC? Again, um, here's, here's a very interesting thing, and this comes back to my, my, my what's bothering me so much. And, and what bothers me is the people who don't have shared decision making, the people who, who don't have the knowledge, they come in here and they're 100% confident about what they're doing. 100%. They don't know a damn thing, but they're really com they're confident about it. They're completely confident. The people who've had the shared decision making are not as confident. After they have both the, the visit with the clinic and so on, they're both showing 100% confidence. But look at this. They aren't making at all the same decisions. So the people in usual care, those are the people who didn't have shared decision making, 71% of them were choosing surgery. In the people who did have the shared decision making, 51% of them were choosing surgery. So I don't know again what that means, but, but it, it comes back to this really curious question I have, and that is, when I make a decision without the information, I am 100% confident of the decision, I stick with the decision, and am I like the man who comes back to me six months later and says, my golf game suffered and nobody told me it was going to. So um, again, demonstrated in a different way, do people change? And you'll see again that the shared decision-making group um, di didn't change as much as the other people did um, as a result of their... Of their um, they, they showed more change. I'm sorry, they showed more change. Sorry, Don, they showed more change, that's right, and than the usual group did. So um, change of decisional conflict, again, this is just a, another way of demonstrating it. So it's pre and post, and this is in each of the areas, in knowledge, in values, in support, and in how sure they were. And deci achieving decisional quality, and I'm going to actually let Dawn explain this slide to you, because, because this is one of her pieces of analysis that she did with my staff. So Dawn, why don't you just explain to them what you're seeing here? So we were really trying to apply how do we measure um, decision quality, and this is in discussions with uh, Karen Sapuka and Annette O'Connor and Stephen Keering. There's lots of people in, in the room that have influenced this. So what we did is we looked at the, a composite index that accounted for multiple measures. So they had to have a knowledge score of 60% or greater on the knowledge test. They had to have values that predicted the choice, and we use a logistic regression formula and Stephen Keering is the one that we've been consulting around that one. And they also had to feel sure of the best option for them. And so you can see here clearly that uh, the group exposed to shared decision making are more likely to have achieved our definition of a quality decision than those exposed to usual care. So again, as we go into discussion in a little while, we'll look at that and we'll think, is that actually the right way to be measuring uh, the impact and the outcomes? So again, uh, just a summary, um, you know, usual care remains sure of wanting to surgery despite having a poor decisional quality and a lower knowledge base. Uh, what does that mean? Um, you know, is, does, is it that there's actually some dogma that is, that is actually being created? And once I've said, because there's a lot of research in this of self-fulfilling prophecy, once I've said something is going to occur a certain way, then I believe it and I actually expect it to be that way. Um, and, and then, you know, they follow through. And if that's the case, uh, in terms of timing, when we talk about where does shared share decision making come in, when is the appropriate time, when should the invent interventions occur, um, that may certainly have some, some impact on those discussions. And again, how do we measure this and, and the impacts? So I'm going to go back now to the slide of, that we have here which is the one I told you I wanted to come back to. And one of the things that I'd like you to consider with me is actually how we can measure um, this as we go forward. One of the things that we're doing right now is we're building an information pathway system. And what that is is actually a system which allows us to collect the data right from the time the person first comes into the system until they exit the system fully rehabilitated. And it connects uh, to both of their medications, to all of the therapy that they have. It connects to uh, their surgical database, it talks about their, their other existing uh, morbidities and so on. And so what we want to ask of this scattergram is what about that 14-15% of people who really weren't happy with their care? 
What, what does that group look like? What are the characteristics of that group? How can we build that into our tools so we can share more information with people and help people to better understand um, what the impact is going to be? And how can shared decision making help to inform that? We've seen from the research we've done that shared decision making has had a huge impact on their health related quality of life scores. So is this actually a self-fulfilling prophecy and is this something that if we actually were to um, to be able to measure for shared decision making as one of the outputs because what we've, we, we've measured here are the things that we're currently collecting which are BMI, um, it's age, it's, it's, uh, it's your gender, it's your surgeon, it's your region. So that's what we're collecting for. And none of those things um, separated out. It didn't matter how we, how we uh, looked for those different variables. The scores were basically identical. We would like to compare it back to the, sh the shared decision making. But here's my problem. If a person has the same score, if they have the same knowledge value, if they had shared decision making or not, if I use the sure scale and the sure scale only, the results, you know, might be exactly the same, but they really aren't telling me very much about that difference, that difference that we saw about the people who, you know, they were sure coming in, sure going out, and yet they didn't change their mind. There was the dogma. So I don't know exactly how to measure it. We have some ideas. We, th we have some ideas about a, a three-dimensional scale and, and, and showing knowledge as, as one of the color variables, but I'm going to put some of that really um, to all of you and ask you to help us with the dilemma that we find ourselves in.